Welcome to IPR Radio. I am Shanjay Mukherjee. In today's episode, we speak to Professor Ignacio Iparaguera, Senior Scientist, Institute of Human Nutrition and Food Science, University of Kiel, Germany, on the role of biotics in animal nutrition and health. In addition to his role at the University of Kiel, Dr. Iparaguera also serves as Sustaining Curtsy Assistant Professor in the Department of Animal Sciences, University of Florida, USA. During the decade following graduate school, he held various positions in the feed industry in the US and Europe. In his position at the university, Dr. Iparaguera leads dual purpose research revolving on the impact selected dietary interventions on the entry of hepatic system and the resulting immunometabolic implications for the host, with special emphasis on biotic strategies. After the break, in the orchestra of life, each creature plays a part. At Sapiens, we see the web of life, where the health of animals reverberates through ecosystems and societies. With innovative technologies, we're redefining the future of agribusiness, sustainably enhancing productivity and profitability. We don't just dream of a better future, we make it. Food safety, quality, and security these aren't just words. They're our mission. We're sapiens. And we're committed to healthier animals because we believe in healthier living. Be a part of our melody. And together, let's compose a better world. For more information about our products and solutions, log into sapiensagree.com. Good morning, Dr. Iparagera. Welcome to IPR Radio. Good morning and pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you so much for your time. In the intricate web of uh, sustaining life, nu nu life, nutrition plays a pivotal role and our exploration today delves into the fascinating world of biotics and their significance in supporting the well-being of animals. Biotics have gained increasing attention in recent years for the potential to revolutionize how we approach animal health and productivity. As we navigate this multidimensional landscape, we intend to uncover the mechanisms through which biotics enter their effect, the benefits they offer, and the latest breakthroughs that propel us closer to a more comprehensive understanding of animal health and nutrition. Our first question to you, Dr. Paragera, today. What does the term biotics mean and refer to? Could you uh, throw some light on that and explain it to us? Sure, uh, sure, I can elaborate on that. Uh, so, uh, uh, well, the, the term biotic, uh, I mean, refers to life or mean life as, as condition in all living organisms. And, but, you know, we also use the term biotic in the context that you just described. Uh, as biotic material or, or substrates uh, or substances or, or compounds. In other words, uh, things that were uh, uh, or compounds that were uh, derived from living uh, organisms or that at one point those organisms were living when they generated those uh, compounds. So uh, more specifically here, the living uh, organism, we are referring to microorganisms uh, in particular, and more specifically, even the, the two, you know, that uh, that we, we use the most or that commercially are used uh, for the production of different uh, uh, products are um, bacteria and fungi. Right, right. So what are the most uh, widely used biotics in animal production? Well, uh, you know, th th this is an area that is uh, very alive, very um, uh, exciting. You know, these days, a lot of energy, a lot of research, uh, uh, a lot of efforts into this arena and it's permanently sort of expanding. Uh, so the, the ones that, that uh, everybody is familiar with, I'm, I'm pretty sure, are the prebiotics and probiotics. Those are the two terms right. that have been around, you know, for, for many, many years. And most people around the globe, I would say, are, are familiarized or they have used them uh, to some extent or, or they have 
at least being introduced to them. Uh, then uh, more current uh, terms and um, that that were you know generated or that were uh, proposed because of the need of defining uh, new uh, products or new technologies. One is symbiotic, and the other one is more recent even, uh, which was coined recently, well, in 2017, I would say, that was proposed, uh, it's called post-biotics. Uh, mm -hmm. So, in summary, the, the, I would say that uh, in most part of the world, of the world, the most uh, widely used uh, biotics are prebiotics, probiotics, symbiotics, and postbiotics. Right, right. So, what are the main reasons, or what are the drivers for using such technology in uh, nutrition and health? Sure, that's uh, that's a very interesting, you know, uh, um, you know, question and an area of of again of of a lot of activity is uh, the, the permanent, you know, evolution of uh, the uses of this uh, technology. So I would say that, uh, and this is personal opinion, of course, uh, I would say that uh, probably the most uh, widely uh, reasons, you know, for, for using these technologies are uh, looking at health, so trying to maintain or improve uh, or prevent uh, deterioration of the health status of, of animals, uh, not only uh, uh, food pro uh, producing animals like, like poultry, but also, you know, pets and, and companion animals like dogs, horses, and others. Right. Uh, then I would say that uh, gastrointestinal issues or, or health, uh, in many places we uh, refer to this as gut health, uh it's, it's very important uh then uh immune challenges uh very specific you know uh immune uh issues uh that affect certain uh um livestock and, and poultry um and and something that maybe it's it's uh resonates uh with a, with a lot of people is the the you know this trend around the world for demedication so uh, what mm -hmm. i mean by mm -hmm. this is reducing the amount of of medicines or drugs that we use in animal production uh so that that has uncovered uh a lot of um needs uh that that were sort of masked by the use of these uh medications in particular antibiotics and in the case of poultry i would say uh, uh you know growth promoting antibiotics uh so that 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 type of strategy or that type of move, you know, towards, you know, uh, demedicated animal production uh, has, you know, opened uh, a door for these uh, technologies uh, to enter. And, and I think that is also, my last but not least, uh, another reason that I, I think is playing here um, an important role is the changing demands of, of on the customer, so the, the end user of animal products i think mm -hmm. it is the public i mean it's becoming more and more right. Right. you know influential let's say mm -hmm. on how we produce and so these technologies i mean the biotic technologies are perceived as more natural more ecological more friendly to the environment and to uh and to the standards you know that the people have so it's helping on that on that too, I guess, and and that is having a, a push certainly uh, in favor of using these these technologies. Right, right. Uh, Dr. Ignacio, you mentioned about uh, prebiotics and uh, symbiotics and postbiotics uh, and probiotics. So, could you kind of help us understand the definition or the differences between each of these uh, biotics? Sure, that, you know, as a whole, that's a very important question. I think uh, it's not only because it's, it's interesting to talk about this or, 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 or have an intelligent conversation about this, but I think it is very important understanding the definitions uh, very clearly because they have a lot of uh, downstream, let's say, uh, consequences. So yeah. let, let's start by, by prebiotics. Uh, so prebiotics essentially are all substrates that can be selectively used by good or beneficial gut microbiota. And as a consequence, 
they generate, uh, you know, a benefit on the host. In other terms, you know, simply put, uh, these are food for the good gut microbiota. And I'm referring gut microbiota because it's mostly what we use in poultry production or in animal production. However, uh, of course, there are microbiota on, on all surfaces like skin, and you can use a prebiotic on your skin. And, and mm -hmm. as long as you know, it's a substrate that can be, it's a food for the good uh, microbes. So these, uh, these uh, prebiotics essentially, um, uh, when we think about this, or when you ask people about this, everybody thinking on fiber. Um, and, and that is true. There are several fiber type of prebiotics. So some examples are inulin, uh, oligo uh, fructosaccharides or, or fructo oligosaccharides like FOS, galacto oligosaccharides like GOS, uh, manan oligosaccharides like MOS. I mean, all those enter in the category of prebiotic. And the condition is that they, they fit uh, what I just said, the definition. They, they are fermented by the good microorganisms and therefore they generate a benefit. However, not all fibers uh, uh, fulfill that. So some fibers, you know, uh, can be fermented, but not necessarily by the good guys, or they not necessarily translate into a benefit uh, on the animal. So those couldn't be, uh, you know, uh, shouldn't be classified as a prebiotic. Now, this area, like I mentioned before, is very alive, and there's permanent evolution. So one evolution is that now we are including new uh, compounds in the category of prebiotics because we are understanding that they, even though they are not carbohydrates, they are not fibers, uh, they still, you know, have the effect that we have defined. So they can be fermented by good microbiota and generate a benefit on the whole. So some examples of these non-fiber prebiotics could be polyphenols. There are some polyphenols that uh, as you probably know, these uh, phytogenic or phytonutrients, or and they have different yeah. uh, names uh, of plant, you know, derived uh, mm -hmm. bioactive compounds and uh, all, uh, some of them, they have benefits on the host and, and for that benefit to realize, uh, they need to be processed, let's say, by the gut microbiota. So one example uh, could be certain type of tannins, uh, so tannins are very large, uh, uh, complex polyphenols that they cannot be uh, digested or absorbed by the animal, uh, and and therefore they get into the lower, you know, gastrointestinal tract where they they encounter the gut microbiota. The gut microbiota can process them, and then the benefits are realized. So it's very much fitting uh, the category or the definition of such. Uh, other examples could be some uh, polysaccharides derived also from uh, microorganisms that do not fit the categories that I just mentioned before. But um, you know, this is this this list is expanding. Um, so an important you know consideration about this is that uh, once again uh, they have to be used by the good gut microbiota. That's, that's a very important thing that we have to keep in, in mind when we think about prebiotic. Then switching to, to probiotics, you know, which is the, I would say, the, the also the uh, oldest uh, term along with, with pre. Uh, pro, probiotics refers to uh, living microorganisms. Uh, so that when are administered in adequate amounts, uh, they confer a health benefit on, on the host. Um, this is essentially uh, either uh, living microorganisms or, you know, uh, cells that can give rise to a living organism. Those would be like spores. So these are uh, th this th this is a very wide area. There's a lot of products, uh, you know, um, available in the market. So most of them are from bacteria. Uh, but there are some of them that are also fungi or fungus, like, uh, you know, yeast, for instance, yeast is a cellular, is a, is a single cell, uh, fungus. And, but all of them fit that category. So, uh, here, uh, the, the important things to, to keep in mind is that it has to be living. It has to either, uh, be, be alive. It has to either, uh, be the microorganism itself 
or it has to uh, uh, germinate and give rise to that uh, microorganism in the target area. Let's say the, the gastrointestinal tract in, in most cases in animal production. Uh, in this case, um, uh, the, there are several model factions. There are some, some effects that are uh, widespread, let's say. A lot, many of the products available in the market uh, can show that effect. But uh, some effects uh, that are of interest, uh, as, as more specific the effect is, let's say against a very specific uh, DC condition uh, or, or things like that, uh, you need to move more into the strain. So the conditions in which uh, the animal uh, is uh, raised and the strain that you are using. So you, you have to be more and more and more careful about what you are selecting when you are looking for very specific functions. If you're looking for, let's say, uh, protection uh, again, against dysbiosis, so dysbiosis understanding as the loss of uh, balance or, or normal composition of the gut microbiota. So let's imagine that, that, that the gut microbiota or the, or, the, or the gut is like a city, you know, where we have a lot of human beings and we have a lot of people uh, playing different roles. And suddenly imagine that we have a stress condition and, and, and that, that, uh, you know, uh, that, that affects, you know, the traffic of that city. So a problem that affects the traffic. So we are encountering, a, uh, you know, a, a, a disorganization, a disbalance of, of how the community used to work. So uh, that, that analogy can be used to think of what means to have a, a balanced gut microbiota. It's exactly the same. Uh, it's, it's, it's a given composition. So certain members of that community are present and in given proportions, and they have these specific interactions that keep the animal in good health and capable of producing the best it can. So uh, some probiotics, I mean, most probiotics, that, that would be a widespread effect, can help in protecting against that disbalance, what we call, again, dysbiosis. Uh, that would be a widespread effect. But now let's uh, define something, you know, more specific. So some probiotics have very specific immunological effects or very specific neurological effects, so affects, you know, the brain, how the brain works. As you go in that direction, from the widespread to the more specific, you need to understand better the strain. So not all probiotics are going to deliver that effect. It's very strain specific. And then uh, you need to understand the conditions in which that animal is even more. So how, what conditions are driving that problem in that animal? And that would largely dictate the success in using that uh, technology. So then uh, moving on, uh, so I don't take all the time on this, but uh, it's symbiotic. Symbiotic is essentially the combination of a pre and a pro, so prebiotic and, and, and probiotic, that when you put them together in a, in, 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 in a package or you deliver them together, then they create synergistic effects. So they benefit, let's say, from being together. So you get the best of the two by combining them already when you deliver them to the animal. So, but is this the conditions that I, I described before apply to a symbiotic? And then the new kid in the block, let's say, it's the uh, postbiotic. And right. postbiotic has been, you know, coined, uh, well, the, 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 the concept has been around for also many years, but uh, there were no consensus in the scientific community how to call them. There were several different terms, parabiotics, uh, uh, tintelized, uh, probiotics. There were, there were many different terms to try to refer to this. So, uh, in 2017, um, a, a consensus paper, uh, was published in, in, in one, in one of the most important, you know, uh, scientific journals in the world that's called Nature. Uh, uh, proposing, you know, um, a definition of this category. And this category, the new term is called postbiotic, uh, post meaning after biotic life. So that tells you a little bit about uh, it's something that after after life. So if you if you look for the definition, uh, it is uh, specific is defined as a preparation of inanimate microorganisms and or their components that confer the benefit 
you know, health benefit to the host. So let's dissect that that uh, definition into layperson terms. So preparation. Preparation means that you have to be intentional about, you know, uh, uh, formulating uh, a given, a given uh, you know, a composition, let's say. So, um, so this recognizes the fact that this formulation uh, can include different components. It's not a single component, right? Uh, then uh, inanimate. Uh, inanimate has been very controversial. There's a lot of discussion about that because for a lot of people it means nothing. But the typical term that we use in, in, in that you, I'm pretty sure you have heard many, many times, it's we refer to microorganisms that are not longer living as inactive uh, microorganisms. We call it an inactive yeast uh, or dead. We also use the term dead, dead yeast or dead uh, bacteria. So uh, what's the problem with that? That we are implying that if it's inactive or it is dead, may no longer be effective. Okay. So to avoid that, inanimate means that cannot give rise to life, but it could be active. So this is recognizing that this preparation is composed of non-living, you know, organisms and their components. Uh, so the, the important thing here is that uh, it's not living, cannot give rise to life, but it's active uh, because the, the uh, compounds uh, or the uh, elements that generate the benefit on the animal uh, are present in that formulation. And so that's, that's the very important thing. Uh, so those are the, the, let's say, the terms, but like I say, postbiotic is the, is the most recent definition. We'll be back after a short commercial break. That is a wake-up call against the growing shadow of antibiotic resistance over our poultry, our health, and our world. To fight this menace, Excelsio, a natural antibiotic free performance enhancer, marshals an army of bacteriophages each engineered by evolution to engage a specific bacterial adversary. Excelsio uses a cocktail of bacteriophages that protects your flock against various strains of Salmonella, E. coli, Clostridium, Perfringens, and Staphylococcus aureus. Excelsio is more than a product. It's our shield against antimicrobial resistance. It's our stand for a safer, healthier future. For more information about our products and solutions, log into sapiensagri.com. Uh, Dr. Ignacio, when we talk about uh, biotics, um, we automatically hear about or think about uh, ISAP. Yeah. Uh, so would you tell us a little bit about ISAP? Sure. Uh, actually, I should have said that before because I have been using the definition set for by, by ISAP. Yeah, uh, ISAP uh, is uh, is an international uh, scientific association for uh, prebiotics and probiotics. Uh, this is a, a non-profit organization, scientific organization, uh, which mission, you know, it's actually ensure the scientific progress in the area of biotics, uh, and you know, work on all these confusing. Area because, like we say, it's very new. It's 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 permanently evolving. Uh, a lot of confusion sometimes, and I'm pretty sure that listeners, you know, and 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 people in India and around the world, you know, producing animals and or, or working with animals to some extent, uh, all of us at one point have been confused by all this terminology, and and you have a new offering in the market that is proposing a new term or you have, you know, claims that are made that this is going to fix this or that, and, and you don't know how to assess all that. Uh, most likely, all of those things are true, but the problem is that we don't have any uh, ability, any knowledge, any capacity to assess, you know, whether th this is 100% uh, right or, or not so, or whether, you know, the conditions that I intend to use that technology is actually uh, relevant for that particular, you know, possibility or opportunity. So <clears throat> this is a very important role of this uh, scientific association is trying to 
advance the understanding and clarify all these uh, gray areas, let's say, uh, which are very important for the user. Uh, so farmers, uh, nutritionists, you know, vet, uh, veterinarians, he health uh, uh, take uh, or taker uh, people, um, and and then it's very also uh, it's very important also uh, I I I would say you know for regulation because okay. as you know <laughs> a big problem that we have around the world many times uh, that is blocking innovation or is uh, uh it's becoming a hurdle you know to to really innovate and bring new things to the market is regulatory you know uh, demands so these definitions are very important to adhere to them so then uh, regulators can take them and set for rules and regulations that then we can uh, follow and ensure that the products that are available in the market first that you have an entry to the market you have access no problem to enter the market and second that you do it under you know this frame uh, right. that ensures you know that it, it for you know a fair game let's say right right now you mentioned that uh, the latest biotic is postbiotic and that's the latest development in the world of biotics so do postbiotics have any specific advantage over the uh, other biotics well let's that's uh, that's, <laughs> that's a that's a good point um all all of them bring uh you know strength and weaknesses sure. so i think that that you know if if we analyze the weaknesses of the other options, then postbiotic offer, you know, some strength or some benefits. So if you if, if you take the case of prebiotic, uh, the, the, I would say that uh, the the maybe the two major or uh, biggest uh, disadvantages or limitations is one. Typically, they are fed in large amounts. Uh, most prebiotics are required in the you know um, 500 to 1000 uh, grams or more uh, per per ton of, of feed so there's the inclusion rate is high so when you when you formulate that diets uh, th th that might be a challenge because you have a very limited space for formulation and in having such a bulky you know uh, demand uh, may not be easy to fulfill and may pose challenges. So that that that's that's one caveat, let's say, or challenge in using prebiotics that postbiotics do not have because most postbiotics are in the grams to to milligrams, so very small dose in general. So that's that's one compared to prebiotics. Another uh, prebiotic caveat, let's say, is that like like, like we define it, right? It's food for the good guys so maybe you are providing the food but you don't have the good guys <laughs> so <Right. laughs> uh, <laughs> so he may he may see that you may you may you know uh, conclude that they are not effective or they are not seeing the effects that you were oh. expecting but indeed you you are not using it the you know in the conditions to see those benefits so that once again, that is something that postbiotic eliminate because postbiotic are re already delivering, you know, the compounds or the microbial cells that are responsible for the effects for the benefits on the host. So let's say they are more immediate or more close to the to the target that you are pursuing. So in that regards, they present advantages related to to prebiotics. They compared to probiotics, which is mm -hmm. the the other big big player here. So as 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 you know and everybody knows, they are living organisms. So this has been a challenge in animal production, particularly because the conditions that uh, that we you know uh, need to operate, let's say, sometimes are very harsh for these living microorganisms to stay, you know, in the concentrations the, uh, that are needed for generating the benefits in other in other words they may be dying at a faster rate that uh that it should happen to see the effects that you want uh or that you need uh the therefore you know for instance the 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 mm, in many places you know the the uh pellets or feeds are you know exposed to pelletine or extrusion 
or, 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 or chemical treatments like the use of acidifiers, things like that, that are either uh, thermal, you know, they, they are important challenges uh, for these living organisms to resist, to tolerate. So basically you are killing them uh, uh, before delivering them. Uh, so this, this is a challenge. Uh, I know there's a lot of companies working on, on improving and, and bypassing this problem, but it's, it's reality. I think it is a problem that affects a lot of uh, probiotics. So stability of the living product and ensuring that that living organism gets to the target area to, to where you need it, most likely the GI tract of that animal. The other thing of, uh, that in the case of postbiotic, like I say, they are already, you know, dead. Let's say they are inanimate. Let's be specific. They are inanimate, meaning that it's no longer living. It was obtained from a living organism. That's why it's a biotic, uh, but it's no longer living and it's much more stable. So you are eliminating that concern completely. So it's not a problem. Stability is a much, uh, let's say, a uh, smaller problem with a postbiotic re relative to a probiotic, okay? Mm -hmm. So then the last point that is important to consider is, as I mentioned, uh, probiotic, probiotics have, you know, widespread effects, like, like we were saying, you know, competitive exclusion, let's say, of pathogens, for instance. Or, or keeping the balance of the gut microbiota. So those are widespread, you know, un, unspecific, non-specific effects. So you're not looking for, you know, nothing very specific, uh, let's say a very targeted solution against necrotic enteritis. You're, you're not looking for that. You're simply providing an environment, a widespread condition. Now, if you want to go deeper and deeper and you say, well, I want to find a very specific, you know, probiotic for this issue, uh, whatever that issue is, now you need to understand much better which is the strain, uh, which is the condition, like I mentioned before. So then your options are reducing and probably there's nothing in your market that is so specific or available for you that allows to, you know, uh, uh, overcome or protect you or your animals against that particular problem. So that is removed by postbiotics. Postbiotics, uh, some of them have this widespread effect and some of the new generation, the ones that are coming to market, are, are more specifically designed against uh, uh, very, very unique targets of interest for the animal, uh, you know, produce uh, farmers or for, or for the animal take care. Uh, so a person. So these these uh, postbiotics remove that. So they 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 uh, are more specifically designed to address those problems. So you are not so concerned about I'm using the right strain. Uh, you of course you always have to ask for the data. Uh, you have to see the data uh, that is proving. You know that uh, I mean sound data. I mean hopefully it's published somewhere. Uh, and that uh, you can assess the data, uh, either you or with the help of a nutritionist or a veterinarian or whoever, and say, yes, this is the right solution for the type of problem that we are looking. So postbiotics uh, present uh, those, uh, probably those advantages uh, uh, against, you know, or compare, I shouldn't say against, compare with pre and probiotics. But certainly they can also, in certain conditions, they may, may be able to work synergistically. So some people may, under certain conditions, they may benefit from the combination of some of them, like a symbiotic, but also probably a postbiotic can be combined with a pre or can be combined with a probiotic under certain conditions. So that's what I'm saying. All of them bring with uh, advantages and disadvantages. Yeah. Uh, and maybe the best way to think is, what is my problem? What is the evidence out there indicating what are the better solutions against this problem? The more specific my problem is, the less options I'm gonna have. And and think about that and, and playing that matching game. You know, what is the best technology, the best, I mean, proven technology for this particular condition I'm looking. If I'm looking at a preventative metaphylactic type of uh, strategy to say, I just want to be sure that, like an insurance, you know, that oh, all my okay. animals are in the best possible condition. So you're not so concerned about all these specific specificities, but yes, about the data that you're using something that is 
well produced and, and with high standards and it has some data packing it too. But then if you are uh, uh, looking for something very specific again uh, against the problem, for instance, something that is becoming more and more relevant in animal production is longevity. So uh, it doesn't matter who uh, where we are looking at. It's not the case of poultry, of course, because they are short living uh, oh, animals. Yeah. But but in the case of uh, uh, of hens or lay layers, and in the case of dairy cows, uh, 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 companion animals, you know, we are looking in general around the globe for extending their uh, lifespan, so longevity. And this is something where there are some postbiotics uh, that have uh, very well data behind back in their use in, in helping those animals to live longer and, and uh, stay productive as they, as they age. Thank you. Now, uh, just for the benefit of our uh, listeners and as an extension of this question, uh, could you just list down or tell us the basic benefits of using biotics, you know, just a few sure. basic benefits. Sure. To summarize. I would, sure. I would say that, that uh, if, if we go to, to summarize, like you were saying, uh, from the from the more widespread effects to the more specific ones. And, and I think the most widespread effects relate to digestive function or gut health like uh you know uh a lot of people refer to when when i using this term i'm, I'm saying the, the the integrity of the of the gut and, and by integrity i mean uh the anatomical so preserving the structure of the gut but also preserving the function which function is you know digesting absorbing and protecting so the gut also has a very important role in protecting the animal it's part of the immune function of the animal so this is one uh, a, a use that I think is widely spread among pre, pro, and post, and symbiotics. All of them, I mean, uh, it's, it's, you can go with your liking, you know, whatever that is, but I think it is it is very well, very well researched. Then, uh, you know, as, as we get more specific, uh, I would say that uh, keeping the immune competence, so in other words, uh, helping the animals to be, you know, to, for the immune system of the animal to be the best possible functioning whenever it's encountering a, encountering a challenge, reacting proportionally to the challenge and recovering fast from the challenge and getting back to uh, uh, a normal condition. So uh, that is another uh, well-researched uh, uh, effect uh, that you can obtain. But now, that is something that has been shown for some prebiotic, for some probiotics, and for some postbiotic. It's not a widespread. So now is where you need to go more in uh, in details. And then uh, uh, I would say that, um, like I mentioned before, uh, e expanding the the life uh, span or ensuring you know that animals can live longer or helping them i shouldn't say ensuring helping them to live mm -hmm. a long productive life then again uh, uh, there's there's some good uh, data uh, back in that effect and and some and some uh, you know uh, uh, options uh, are available in the market that have pretty good data behind and last but not least uh, because i know this is of interest uh, some um, uh, probiotics, uh, in particular, um, and, and some postbiotics are are having some some support or some data supporting their use uh, in these scenarios where medication is uh, reduced, particularly antibiotic growth promoters. Uh, so there, there's some pretty good data there also showing that uh, they can help in transitioning into that new way of producing. Our last question, uh, Dr. Ignacio, a slightly philosophical question. Uh, what are the major frontiers that you think are yet to be conquered in the biotic field? A little futuristic question. Sure. <laughs> uh, 
That's uh, well. That can take another half an hour to answer, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. But I think that, that, that that's 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 very uh, uh, important question. Actually, uh, the I think you know as as, as we gain uh, better tools uh, to you know research uh, all these areas. I think that we need to. Uh, go into understanding them better, describing them better. So there, there, there's a need for much more, much more uh, in-depth understanding of how these, you know, uh, strategies, technologies work, which is the mode of action. How do, what is the mechanism uh, that they, you know, uh, rely upon to deliver the effects that you are seeing? So. In many, many, many situations, we have that feeling of a black box, right? We have the feeling like, uh, okay, uh, I'm throwing this into my feed, and I'm seeing that, okay, animals are producing more eggs, or my 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 uh, poultry, uh, my birds are growing a little bit faster or converting uh, a little bit better. Uh, but how is that happening? If we don't fully understand how that is happening, it's very difficult that we can deliver consistency. So sometimes we're gonna be here, sometimes we're gonna be there. You right. look at the veterinarian or the nutrition if whoever recommended that and, and say, well, why it's not working now? And that is a very difficult question to answer because we don't have a very good understanding how that works. So to do that, we need to go deeper and deeper into understanding uh, how they operate, uh, how they work, uh, you know, um, understanding better this strain level. So going very deep, into uh, this biology and understanding, you know, all the intricate, you know, interactions that happen within the gut and within the animal. And now we, we are having tools, you know, we are having research to all these omic technologies, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that pretty sure everybody has heard some terms about this genomics, you know, metabolomics, yeah, proteomics, yeah. yada, yada, all these things. Uh, are are now can be combined because they have become affordable, uh, or I shouldn't say affordable, but they, they become more and more affordable than they used to be. And we can use all these technologies now to really go deeper and deliver that kind of knowledge. So I think that is probably the the, the biggest uh, or highest frontier, you know, to to conquer. So it would be amazing that that we get one day where you say I have this particular problem. Uh, let's say have necrotic enteritis and you have defined, you know, what clostridium and what other, you know, toxins mm -hmm. are having, are causing that, that you can have a solution specifically targeted against that. That is specifically as, as more like a drug, mm -hmm. if you will, uh, type of approach. So I think we, we're going to get closer to that, more precise, more personalized. Mm -hmm. We can talk about personalization. <laughs> That's not correct for animals, but I think uh, more more uh, targeted or more custom made right. problem and not so blanket solution mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. in many cases they are today, right? So I right. think that is the frontier to conquer. Wonderful. Uh, it's been lovely speaking to you today, Dr. Ignacio, and thank you for uh, taking our time to be with us and to talk to us on this rather interesting uh, domain. And I'm sure our listeners have got a lot of good insights and a lot of useful insights from you today. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you to you. Thank you for this time. I, I love uh, this opportunity and, and, and thanks for being so welcoming. And I hope people find it interesting and useful. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank Goodbye. you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. To be notified of upcoming podcasts, like and subscribe our YouTube channel at IPR Radio today.